Good morning. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. God is here. Let us celebrate. God's plans for the world cannot be obliterated by the foolishness of men. God continues to renew his world. He does this through those who relate to him. God's love is sure and everlasting. Our spoken to his love are filled with joy. Let us worship the God who gives us cause for celebration. The hymn is, O God, our help in ages past, hymn 78.
continue this service of worship, we are called to confess who we are in God's eyes. And in doing so, we recognize that there are those in the world who do not recognize the name of God. There are those who try to confuse others about God's very existence. There are those who mock the church, who use the church for their own purposes, who react God's efforts to change them from within. We can fall prey to these ideologies and allow our trust to be eroded. God is faithful and he desires his people to be faithful. Let us confess to God that we too have succumbed to untruth and unbelief. Together, reading the words of the prayer of confession. Lord God, forgive us when we are distracted by the voices around us. Forgive us when the words of men become more in our ears than the words of God. Forgive us when we join the chorus of God is dead. Forgive us when we start to believe that the church is irrelevant. Send your powerful spirit to guide and direct our thinking. Send a renewal of your love and guidance to us through your world. Restore us, Father, to the truth of who you are and the reality of who Christ Jesus is and ever will be. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Our God is bigger than any misconception. His truth is larger than any distortion. Our God is loving and everlasting. He is a forgiving God, always ready to embrace and reassure his children. Our God loves us and cares for us. Let these truths carry us into and through the days ahead. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us stand and pass the peace to those around us in God's name. Please be seated. Now I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message, and Tim Fennell, our Director of Youth Ministry, is going to lead the children's message this morning. Hi guys. Can you hear me? How are you doing this morning? Yeah? Awesome. So I wanted to talk to you guys about this really amazing story um, about Jesus with a paralytic man. Do you, know, um, do you know what it is to be paralyzed so they can't walk, right? So what's, what's amazing about this story is Jesus is already super popular in, like, really much. So everywhere he's going, like, people are following him with these crowds and everything. So he comes into this town, and all these people follow him. And then there's religious leaders that also uh, join in, in seeing, like, Jesus' teaching. Well, there are some guys that have a friend who's paralyzed, and they're like, we got to get him here. So they figure out a way to get him there, but when they get there, they can't get in. There's too many people. So they devise this plan to get him in somehow. So what they do is they go up on the roof of someone else's house, okay, and they dig a hole, like human-sized hole, so like you and I can actually like fit into it. And they lower him down, and so think about this. All of a sudden, Jesus is teaching Tons of people around. It's sweaty. It's it's gross, and the floor just like or the roof just like drops. Like it seems like it just it's there. There's dust. There's dirt. There's people looking down, and this man is coming down from the ceiling. It's kind of funny if you think about it. Like how is he getting down there, right? So he lays there, and Jesus looks up at his friends, and then looks at the man and says, "Your sins are forgiven." Now those religious leaders that are in this crowd actually get pretty upset with that because. He's essentially saying that he is God, because only God can forgive sins. Jesus knows what they're thinking, and he looks at them and says, 
Which is easier to say? Either get up and walk, or your, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus then turns back to the paralyzed man and says, get up, take your mat, and go home. And this man, who'd never been able to walk, completely paralyzed, jumps up, grabs his mat, and like leaves in complete joy. And it says that he's praising God all the way. What seems really cool is that everyone in that crowd starts praising God as well. It's just, it's so amazing. But what I want us to think about is the fact that these friends did everything they could to bring their paralyzed friend to, um, to Jesus. And so we have gotten a chance to do that. So who brought you to church today? Uh, who? Uh, my mom and dad. Your mom and dad? And who, how about you? Mom and dad? And what about you? Grandma, awesome. So, right, we have either family members or friends that brought us. We got a chance to hear about Jesus and meet Jesus. My best friend was the first person to bring me to church where I got to hear about Jesus. So, it's really exciting that we have those people in our lives. So, now we get to be that, that type of people. We get to be those people who bring other friends to church. So, I actually have this little, like, friends pass to give you. Pick your color. So, and if you want to invite anyone to church, you just can give them that as like a simple thing, and they then get to hear about Jesus. How about that? Do you want to pick your color? Awesome. What color do you want? I want purple. All right. Yes. <laughs> what, color, what color would you like? Awesome. Right. Okay. Well, we're going to pray, and then you guys can go off to Sunday school. All right, so let's put our hands together and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for having friends and family and people who have brought us to you, that we've gotten to experience your love and get to meet your son. God, just thank you for always forgiving us and just being there. As we go throughout this week, just protect us and let us enjoy our time with our friends and our family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks, guys. The hymn is Be Still My Soul, hymn 530.
I'd like to invite Tim Fennell back up to give his presentation on the Dominican Republic trip. Hi everyone, we have some pictures of this. So, I got to spend a full week uh, working with Sowers of the Kingdom in the Dominican Republic. And it was a very eye-opening week for myself. I have lived uh, in Costa Rica that has a lot of similar issues, we can say, but I would say the difference is it's not, it wasn't as intensely concentrated as what I got to see here. So my heart broke a little bit as we were there, and it's just, it was so great for us to be able to serve these folks. And also, like, they, like, we got to love on them, but they showed us so much love, it was unbelievable. So we have some pictures. This one was actually on our first day. Uh, so we're on the quads, and this, so what had happened to this man, like, maybe 30 minutes prior, uh, we, had, we had driven up onto him, he's in the middle of the road, face down, right? and no one knew, no one was around him, we did not know what happened, and we, we were concerned, so we asked the pastor of the church we were going to, to get ready for VBS, and he, uh, he comes out, we, and our, the other pastor that's with us, they go up to him, and they finally get him up. But when we get there, there's three women just watering him as if he like, has heat stroke or something. But no one knows what to do with him. And they get him up, and they ask him, like, what's wrong? He was twitching beforehand and everything. So we had, something medical had, had happened. And come to find out, he, um, he has epilepsy. So he had an epileptic seizure in the middle of the street. Guys, it was... 94 degrees outside. It was insanely hot and humid, and this man is just lying there, and his face is all banged up and everything, but we got him up, we got him sitting down in this chair, and for about 20 minutes, people were around talking to him, seeing what was going on, and he had run out of his uh, medication, and for a year, it only cost 86 US dollars, which blows my mind, and he, he wasn't able to afford it, so we were trying to figure out different ways that we can help, but he needed to come with this prescription. Well, as we walked away, and I was standing with the pastor behind, I turned around, and this woman had walked up. She was not in the crowd before, no, was not there at all. And she just came over and prayed over this man. And it was a very emotional sight for me. It was so beautiful to see, like, this community, like, just this one woman has no idea who this guy is, and just wants to pray over him, had talked to him. And she stayed there for another 10 minutes. Like, she was not leaving his side. It was absolutely beautiful. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what happened to this man later on. We don't know if he came back to VBS um, or, or not to, for us to be able to pay. But it was amazing to see um, how much the community came together and what we can do to help this community. So, the next picture. Um, some of the things that we were doing, we did, we did a few things. So we did VBS. Um, we worked on the Mission House with construction. Uh, we did baseball game, so we were with kids uh, most of the time, and it was absolutely wonderful. But this was VBS in the, actually where that incident had happened, this is the next day, or a couple days later. And we were with a group, uh, some of the guys are also from South Carolina and Florida. But, yeah, so this, look, look at this crowd of all these kids getting to hear about the gospel. It's amazing. Uh, this is in the, the city area. Uh, it was it was really well done. It was wonderful. Uh, the next picture. And so this is the construction. That's Mauricio. He's an absolute goofball. He's wonderful. He's part of the mountain, like part of the group that's up on the mountain. Yes, if you think that he's dancing there, he is dancing there. We were goofing off for a moment. Uh, we caught some moments of joy. But we were building a kitchen outside for this mission house uh, for eventually what would be able to happen is have groups come and stay at the mission house to be able to serve the community up on the mountain. So something that's drastically different from where I lived in Costa Rica is um, by the government in Costa Rica, you have to, no matter what your situation is in life, you are given the access to water. That is not the case for the uh, Dominican Republic. And so the mission house is the access for this entire community's water. Uh, so we'd be able to help them even more. But that was something that was really interesting. Every road is paved, but not everyone has access to water. So it was hard to see. But we, we did some construction there, um, and it's, it's moving around, along pretty well. Next picture. So this was the baseball uh, game. So we got to watch these, uh, these guys play some baseball. 
And I'm just now getting into baseball, moving here, and it was amazing to watch like 10 to like 16 year olds hit this ball going at them at least like 80 miles an hour. Like it was, and I mean just send it. It was awesome to watch this. But we got them new um, new jerseys and kits and everything. They had a blast. Uh, and our team won. I guess it was the first time in a long time that our team finally won. So everyone was really happy about that. Um, go ahead, next one. And so we also went to a graduation of the school that we support. So there, you, you can have an opportunity to actually sponsor these kids, and it's thirty dollars a month. And I would, I would love to see us as a church pour into these kids more because they are, they're just so excited to be at school. They like, they sang for us. So it doesn't. Like, the next moment, all of these kids are actually like singing to us, and they were all about like having a blast um, and actually singing like worship songs. And that was so cool to see because. That's not something we ever get to see in our schools today. Like, as a teacher, I couldn't even talk about, like, the worship songs I liked. Couldn't even, like, play them in our rooms, things like that. So, go ahead. This was our last VBS up on the mountain. So, these are, this is all, the, this is every single kid that's on the mountain. They all got to come up here. And, unfortunately, they only had one day of vacation Bible school. But, we got to spend time with them. And I spent a lot of time with uh, some of the boys up on the mountain because I was doing uh, a lot of construction for most of the week. Uh, and so I got to really like, develop a relationship with some of, the, some of the younger guys, and it was really awesome. And, and some of these boys, you'll see the next picture, actually, I think it is. Yeah, so this little guy here, he surprised me as I'm like moving dirt for a retaining wall. He comes up with a, with a pickaxe and actually loosens up all of the dirt to make it easier for me to like move it, and then he gets in there and starts like moving this dirt with us. He and his two other friends, and we had a blast together. So I just I encourage us to continue to help these communities and to pour into these kids and these these people that they also they love Jesus. Um, just like listening to them, they don't speak a lot of English. But one of the coolest things I heard from uh, two women up on the up on the mountain was they came out to us. Actually, uh, Ron Thompson asked them how, how they're doing, and they go, the plan is good. The plan is good. It's like, what, what do you mean the plan is good? God's plan is good. So no matter what their predicament they were in, they, like, they love God, and they know like, that God's plan is good, no matter what. It was just it's a different paradigm to think about life altogether. It was just awesome to see. It was great to spend time with them. So that was, that was my week in a Dominican Republic, and I really encourage us to continue to support these people. So, thank you. Thank you, Tim. God's plan is good. Yes. A few more announcements this morning. I'd like to invite Ron Tompkins forward to give us an announcement about a hike that's coming up. Can we come up here? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Tompkins. For those of you that don't know me, and God is good all of the time. Um, uh, just here to invite, uh, extend an invitation. We've been doing a fellowship hike slash walk uh, once a month, uh, trying to uh, get us an opportunity to get together as a church and go out and, and uh, spend some time together. Uh, today we'll be going over to Time Moore Park. And uh, so this, this walk will be... Uh, on fairly flat terrain. Um, we'll make it as long or as short as you'd like. And I uh, just want to extend an invitation. So we'll be meeting here at the church at 1230. And uh, if you need a little extra time, just uh, please let us know. And um, then we'll be probably going off from time more somewhere around 1 o'clock uh, this afternoon. Anyway, if you have a chance, uh, please come along. We'd love to uh, spend some time with you this afternoon. And thank you, too. And Trish has an announcement about the Wednesday night worship. Just wanted to extend again an invite for Wednesday night worship. So this Wednesday night worship was born out of COVID when we had no place to worship. And, you know, we had the blessing of that enormous tent out in the parking lot. So, again, just very grateful for that. But please, please consider coming and joining us on a Wednesday night. It's a great way to take a break in the middle of the week, reconnect with God. I find that so rewarding week after week. 
you know, life just gets too busy and to be able to just take a break and reconnect with God in the middle of the week. We do a little devotion, we sing, and it's a great time. It, it's almost like a small group, you know. It's come to be my small group in, in so many ways. We pray for each other, we bring our joys and concerns. So please consider joining us. It's the first and third Wednesday of every month. So the next one is this Wednesday, August 3rd. We'll be in the parking lot at 6.30 underneath the tent. Weather permitting, if you don't see us there, we will be here in the sanctuary. So please consider joining us. If not this Wednesday, maybe come out the third Wednesday. Thank you. Go and bring your own chair. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. Our Vacation Bible School is coming up on uh, August 15th through 19th, and we have 55 children registered, which is great news. You can clap to that if you want. Um, I mean, that's compared to my first year here. Granted, that was during COVID, but we had six kids that year, so to have 55 this year is, is great. It's going to be under the 10th, 5th, uh, August 15th through 19th. Um, also, there's a Renegades Faith Night on August 10th, and I understand that the Renegades, according to this paper, are in first place. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Renegades Faith Night will be August 10th, so please uh, contact Birgit in the church office if you're interested in coming along on that trip. I also want to let you know that every worship service, we have someone praying for our... Uh, for each of us as we worship. So someone goes into the back room here and prays for us and for our worship. Um, and that happens both services, 8.30 and 10.30. It's a very important uh, ministry in the church. Some of you have probably served as, uh, as prayers in the past. We need more people to sign up uh, to volunteer to pray. It's a really special ministry. So please talk to Ginny Young if you're interested in signing up to pray for the worship service. And now I'd like to invite Percy and Shireen to come forward. Percy and Shireen Gilbert uh, are great friends of this church and, as you know, have been members here for about 15 years. And this morning we're saying goodbye to Percy and Shireen. They just closed on their house. They'll be moving to Austin, Texas, where Percy has a new uh, exciting job and position there. Um, so this is a, a bittersweet morning. We're, we're grateful for what God is doing in your lives, but we're really sad for, uh, personally sad for to see you here. So what I want to do this morning is offer a prayer for uh, Percy and Shireen. Uh, Shireen served as vice president of consistory here. She also served as a Sunday school teacher for many years and also has served in mission. Uh, Percy served on CMP, he was also the chair of the search committee, which is where I first got to know Percy and Shireen, and uh, has also led Bible studies over the years. So I just, there's so much that you've done for this congregation over the last 15 years, and we're all going to miss you uh, tremendously. So. Uh, let's say a prayer, and I, I ask you just to raise your hand as we pray for Percy and Shereen. Let us lift our hearts in prayer. Lord God, you call your people to move to new places. We think of Abraham and Sarah. We think of Mary and Joseph and Paul and Barnabas. They could not have found their moves easy, but you had called them to new ministries, new places, and they had to say goodbye to friends when they moved. Yet they also trusted that you were guiding them to the new places they were going. Now, God, we pray that you would protect and guide our beloved friends, Percy and Shireen, as they prepare to leave this place, to leave friends in the Hudson Valley, to leave our church community. God, we pray that you would bless their new home in Austin. We pray that their new house would soon feel like a home. Help them, God, to form new friendships. Open the way for them to find a new church where they can continue to worship in a community of believers, a church where they may continue to grow in your grace and spirit and truth. God, bless their new jobs. Bless all that they will do in their new community to serve. God, may Percy and Shireen take with them hearts filled with your love and grace. May they know the love and the friendship goes with them from this church and from each one of us. We pray also that everyone that they work with and live with 
will see the face of Jesus Christ in them and their work just the way that we did. That they would be witnesses the way they've been witnesses to us. God bless them in their way. Bless them to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you like to? When we came to Hopewell 15 years ago, we were welcomed with open arms and just warm greetings from the very day we walked through the door. And we knew that God brought us to this place for this season. It's been 15 wonderful years. Uh, we raised our kids in this church. Uh, you have loved on my daughter. You have loved on my son. You have loved on my wife. And I thank you all for everything, all of that love. You loved on me. <laughs> and uh, for the fun that we had in our Sunday school classes, for the fun that we had at CMP, and just doing all the work of the Lord over these last 15 years. Uh, we just have nothing but gratitude to this congregation. Uh, we thank you so much for all that you've meant to us. Uh, this is not the by I plan to come back. We plan to come back to the Hudson Valley. Uh, our favorite time of year is the fall when the apples and, and the um, cider donuts are plentiful. Um, and so we will, when we come back to the Hudson Valley, we'll definitely come back to Hopewell and worship and visit. But uh, thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Please take some time after the service to say goodbye to Percy and Shereen. As it is, <coughs> excuse me, as it is as much an offering that we make of our lives, and Percy and Shereen are an example of that, we're willing to make moves and transition as God calls them. We are also called to use our funds, the money that God has given to us. We use it for many things. We indulge in activities that entertain us and things that bring us pleasure. We buy books that are enlightening. But God asks us to remember Him and the needs of His church. He challenges us to be salt and light to a community around us. That's what God wants first of all from each one of us. To assure Him that we desire being obedient to Him. And at this time we have an opportunity to make those offerings to God in His name and for His purposes.
Scripture teaches us and asks the question, how will people know about Jesus if we don't tell them? Indeed, how can our church be a beacon of hope and truth if we do not support it? Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless each one who has given. Assure them that you will bless and multiply these offerings for use in your kingdom to help dispel apathy and unbelief in our community and in the world. Amen. As we enter this time of intercessory prayer, let's take some time just to quiet our hearts and to pray silently to God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every place with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, always persevere in supplication for all the saints. As you pray, think of those who are in need of our intercessory prayers. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for those in our congregation this morning who are in need of intercessory prayers, in need of healing and encouragement. We also come to you to give thanks. We give thanks this morning for Teresa Gerlach's good news, her good report after surgery, prayers for continued strength and healing for Teresa. We pray this morning for Jeff Gerlach and his father who is in, the hosp in hospice. Continued prayers for Sue Roger, who's recuperating at home after surgery. God, we continue to pray for Ginny, who's worshiping with us this morning. We pray for Carol and Greg McGann's son-in-law, Jim Valdez, who was taken to the hospital on Wednesday, and for their daughter, Heather. We pray this morning for Bob Hand, who's in the hospital, for Jan Bushy's sister, Joyce, for her healing and restored energy and comfort. For Mike Nolan's mo mother, Margaret, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. We pray for Cindy Warren that you'd comfort her in her grief at the death of her sister, Chris. God, we pray for our friends, Percy and Shireen. We also pray that for uh, Mason and Shelley, and we pray that as they leave Dutchess County and HRC and move to their new home in Texas, that you would bless them on their way. God, we pray this morning also for the families and friends of the 25 people who lost their lives during the flooding in Kentucky. Especially we think about the Noble family who lost four children in the flood. God, we pray for them and their loss. We pray for those struggling in this difficult economy. And we pray for our missionaries, missionaries of the month, Mike and Rena Riley, and their work in with Ukrainian ref refugees. <clears throat> And God, we pray the prayer that you, you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing our summer sermon series, studying through the book of Acts. And we've been looking at how the book of Acts is like God's blueprint for the church. And we've been asking ourselves, how do we keep ourselves as Christians and the church on track with that blueprint? How might we have veered off and how might we need to get back on track with God's blueprint for the church? This morning, the passage that we're reading is from uh, the book of Acts chapter 12. This is verses 1 through 11, 18 and 19, and verse 24. And this is a, a story of the persecution of the early church. This is, this is an intense topic, but it's an important topic for us to talk about and to cover. 
So we're going to focus on the persecution of the early church. And you'll see in this story, this is one of the very first moments of the persecution of the very first church. And that persecution has happened all throughout history. It's still happening today. I'm going to share some stories with you from my own personal experience about the persecution of the church today. But as I read this scripture, I want to invite you to think about your own trials, your own, uh, the, the things that are happening in your life that are um, struggles that you're facing. How is it that you personally are being persecuted? Maybe not by an outward enemy, but by a circumstance. So hear the word of God as it is written for us. Let us pray to open God's word. God, your word is filled with stories about people who have stood tall for their faith in Christ. These people did not allow their unbelief or other people to erode their faith. Teach us through your word how we also can be strong in our faith. Teach us how to rely on your spirit to be our defender and our guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the word of God as it is written for us in the book of Acts chapter 12, beginning to read at the first verse. King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was done during the festival of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while guards in the front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. The angel tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly! The chains fell off of his wrists. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him, and he did not realize that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought that he was seeing a vision. And after they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went outside and walked along the lane, when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When morning came, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and could not find him, he examined the guards and ordered them to be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. But the word of God continued to advance and to gain adherence. Here ends the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. Amen. So this story is another piece of the blueprint that God has provided for us in God's church. When God's church is persecuted, or when we personally are persecuted, God provides a plan, a way out. And I'm going to share with you four strategies for how we can approach persecution in our personal lives, but also struggles, difficulties, and also how the church can face persecution. As I said, the book of Acts is like God's blueprint for the church, and every blueprint, when you think about it, anticipates the difficulties that will come upon the house. If there's a heavy snow load, the architect has provided for a steeper roof. For wind speeds, the architect has provided for bracing in the... uh, the, the, uh, the walls of the house, and for weather, for heavy weather and rains, the architect has provided for weatherproofing, or in our basements, hopefully in your basement, for um, vapor barriers, I guess is what it is, that prevents our basements from flooding, which happens so often in this region. But the point is that the architect plans for and prepares for 
these trials that are going to come, uh, come against the house. And in the same way, God has provided in Scripture a plan for us to get through persecution. God understood that persecution would come against the church and against us personally. There are always forces that will come against the church. Right from day one, right from the beginning, there were forces that did not want Jesus Christ and the knowledge of Christ to be spread. And that's still true today. If we are being the true church, we will grow and prosper. If we are not being the true church, there's no reason for us to grow and prosper. But if we are being the true church, we can expect, Jesus said, to face persecution. So I want to start just by looking at a couple of details of this, this first section. What was it? What was the kind of persecution that was coming against the church? Why was Herod persecuting the church? And who was Herod? It says in the first verse, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. So as we look at scripture, there are three King Herods. They're all from the same family, the same dynasty, three different kings who ruled Israel at different periods. But this passage is talking about Herod Agrippa. And there's two important things that we need to know about Herod Agrippa in order to understand this type of persecution that was coming against the church and why it was coming against the church. And the first is that Herod Agrippa was absolutely hated and distrusted by the Israelites for two reasons. First, because he was a corrupt king. He had done dealings with the Romans for his own political gain, and so they didn't trust him. But the second reason, and this is interesting, is that Herod Agrippa was an Edomite. Now that's fascinating because the Edomites were enemy tribes to the Israelites. How on earth did an Edomite get to be king over another tribe, the Israelites, an enemy tribe? If we look in the, the scriptures in Psalms 137, verse 7, it says this about the Edomites. It says, remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day that Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Okay, so we know that the Edomites were enemies of the Israelites. We also read in Numbers chapter 20 where uh, Moses is taking the Israelites out of the desert, out of slavery, and bringing them into the promised land. And he wants to pass through the territory of the Edomites. And in Numbers chapter 20, Moses says to the king of Edom, please permit us to pass through your land. But the Edomites answered, we refuse to let you pass through our country. If you try, we will march out and attack you. Okay, so we know that the Edomites were enemies of the Israelites. At about 120 uh, BC, the Israelites conquered the Edomites and forced them to convert to Judaism. But the Edomites, so they were Jewish and then they were part of the Israelite tribe, but they never really believed in the temple religion. In fact, Herod would not enter the temple. So that was the second reason why the Israelites did not trust Herod, because he was an Edomite. Edomites were never fully insiders into the tribe of Israel. Now why, how did an Edomite get selected to be a king over the Israelites? That was a Roman decision, and it was by design. It was a great strategy of the Romans. If they wanted to keep their subjects from being in conflict with them, they knew that the best way to do that was to keep them fighting with each other. Are you with me? He kept them fighting with each other. What better strategy than to choose a king of the Edomites to be king over the Israelites and keep that internal conflict going? By the way, that's still the way the enemy seeks to destroy the church. That's one of the ways, is by keeping internal division. If the enemy can keep us focused on fighting within each other, no better way to undermine the church. So that's what's happening right from the beginning. King Herod is not trusted by the Jews. But then it says, very interesting detail, that King Herod arrests Peter at the time of unleavened bread during the Passover. That was exactly the time that Jesus was brought out to be persecuted, arrested, and brought out on trial during the Passover. It's the same exact time of year. Why? Because that was the time of year when the Israelites were gathered from all over the Mediterranean, all over the Middle East. They would come as a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So Herod knew, I've got all of the people gathered here, all of the Israelites gathered. This is my opportunity to demonstrate to them my strength. 
They were all against this new movement, this new Christian movement, followers of Jesus. So he thought, if I can, be, if I can show my strength and be harsh against the Christians in front of all the Jews who are gathered, I will regain my popularity as a king. That was his motivation. And so Herod persecutes the church by killing James and by arresting Peter. Now, they were the leaders of this movement, and that's another great strategy. If you want to undermine a movement, you take out its leaders. That's still a strategy that the enemy uses today. If you want to undermine the church, undermine the leadership. Leadership of any church is under greater risk, I think, of being undermined. So we can see from the story in the book of Acts that the, person, the persecution of the church was happening from day one, has happened all throughout history, and is still happening today. The church today in the United States seems to be facing greater persecution. I've heard people talking about that. But in the mission work that I've done overseas, um, I want to share with you that the, the, the church here in the United States is not persecuted anywhere near to the degree that churches overseas are persecuted and Christians overseas are persecuted. The Anglican theologian John Stott said, persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. The clash that we are now seeing, he said, against the Christian church is between those who believe, trust, and love, the God, love God as he is revealed in the Bible and those who do not. So that's John Stott's definition of persecution. When the church today is preaching God as revealed in the Bible, which is Jesus as Lord, it will be persecuted just as it was in the first century. So there are four strategies that we see outlined in Scripture about how Christians can cope with persecution. And I want to share three true stories with you this morning about, about that persecution. But before I share the first story, and these stories reveal those four steps, those four strategies and how to overcome persecution in the church. And again, like I said at the beginning of the sermon, this is also how to overcome the personal persecutions that we are facing, whether that's illness, whether that's a, a, a disagreement in a relationship, whatever it is that you're going through, these four strategies apply to helping you to get through those difficulties. The first strategy is to pray for those who persecute you. And so the story that I want to share is about um, a story that uh, happened in Saudi Arabia. And this is a true story that I witnessed. But before I tell this story, I really hesitate, actually, to tell this story. Um, because it can be misleading. Um, so I have to say, before I share the story, that this is not at all indicative or characteristic of Muslims. We have grown to be very suspicious of Muslims in the United States. But, you know, the truth is I lived for seven years as a missionary in Oman, which is a Muslim country, and I traveled all throughout Saudi Arabia and um, Lebanon and uh, Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates and uh, all, of the, all of the countries of the region. And I never once, never once was persecuted for my faith. Never once. In fact, I did not face opposition. I did not face anger. What I faced instead was a great deal of honor and respect from Muslims and from Muslim governments and from Muslim people and leaders um, for being a leader of a Christian church, a leader of, within a Christian denomination. So um, this idea that Muslims are against Christians is absolutely false. Though there are isolated groups of extremist Muslims who persecute Christians. So I needed to say that first before I share this story, because this story, remember, please keep in mind, this is the exception, not the rule, okay? So every summer I used to teach a course at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom through the Faculty of Divinity, and it was a course in religion and peace building, and we would bring Jews and Christians and Muslims together from armed conflict situations in um, Africa and in the Middle East. And we bring these leaders together to more deeply understand and appreciate each other's uh, differences and, and also grow to understand their similarities. And we had study groups together. We would study each other's scriptures together. So on this one particular day at, at Cambridge, we were studying. I had uh, the two Muslims, two Christians, and two Jews in my group. And we were studying the Gospel of Matthew. And we were reading through Matthew chapter 5. 
And it was, we were all taking turns reading, and it was this uh, young woman from Saudi Arabia, it was her turn to read. And I'm not going to use her real name, but I'll call her Saba. So Saba was reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 44. Saba was from a region of Saudi Arabia where there were tribes that were, had been fighting with each other for um, over 100 years. There was this entrenched tribal warfare between her tribe and the neighboring tribe. So here's what she read. She read the words of Jesus, which are, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And then we started discussing that passage, and Saba put her hand over her mouth and pushed her chair back from the table and began to weep. And after the session was over, I asked her if everything was okay. She said, yeah, everything is okay. These are tears of joy and amazement. She said, when I read those words from Jesus saying that we should pray for and love our enemies, I realized this is the answer. This is the answer. This is what it would take for my tribe and my neighboring tribe to stop fighting with each other if we really did this. And I started to think, she said, that these words must be from God. That weekend, we went to London, and we, we each went to, on Friday, we went to a mosque. Uh, on Saturday, we went to a synagogue. And on Sunday, we all went to a church together. And even the Muslim students came along to this church. And Saba was sitting at the end of one of the pews. She had her abaya on, which is the black covering. And she was hunched over. And I, I wondered if she was OK. And I went over and saw what she was doing. She had her iPhone. And she was taking pictures of the Gospel of Matthew, taking pictures of every page, turning the page, taking a picture, turning a page, taking a picture. This is dangerous for me to do right here because I'm losing my place in my sermon. But she was turning the pages, taking a picture. And uh, I said, Saba, we can give you a Bible. And she said, no, I can't take a Bible with me because the government will confiscate it when I get off the plane. She said, the reason I'm doing this is I want to be able to read through the Gospel of Matthew on the plane, and I'll erase these pictures before I land. And I said, well, what would happen if you had a Bible in Saudi Arabia? And she said, well, it's possible the worst case scenario would be that I could be uh, killed by one of the extremists in my tribe. She said, but, um, but the minimum that would happen is I would be disowned by my family. I cannot risk taking this into Saudi Arabia. And during the pastoral prayer in that worship service, Saba prayed for her enemies. She prayed for that neighboring tribe. Can you believe that? So that's the first strategy. We see it in scripture. Pray for your enemies, love them, bless them, forgive them. It's the first strategy in facing persecution. Forgive your persecutor. Whatever it is you're going through in your personal life, forgive your persecutor. Here's the second strategy. Persevere. Do not ever, ever compromise your faith. Do not ever give up your faith, no matter what. So here's the second quick story I want to share with you. This was, um, this was in Amman, Jordan, and this happened right after the Iraqi war. I helped to convene a group of uh, Iraqi evangelical pastors, uh, Orthodox pastors, and Catholic pastors together in Amman, Jordan. Now, Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, uh, Saddam Hussein was not a good leader, as we know, but one of the things that Saddam's government did was to protect the Christians in Iraq. 6.5% of Iraqis are Christian. As soon as that government fell, the extremists took over and began to persecute the Christians. And so the purpose of this meeting in Amman, Jordan, was to bring these evangelical uh, Orthodox and Catholic pastors together to have a place where they could process the trauma that they had experienced with their congregations after the government fell. So, and so these pastors had, had experienced um, groups like Al-Qaeda coming in and executing the members of their churches. And um, also burning their houses down, uh, capturing them and torturing them. I still remember one of the men had all of his fingers broken. I know this is intense stuff, but this is, this is what happens in the world. This is real. His fingers were all mangled and broken as he told his stories of persecution in Iraq. 
And um, they were all kind of crying together and emoting together and sharing these stories of persecution. But here's what amazed me about it. Every one of them wanted to go back to Iraq after this conference was over. We're going to go back to Iraq to continue their ministries. They were not giving up on their faith. They were persevering. So that's the second point. Persevere. Whatever it is you are going through, do, do not let your faith waver. Do not let your faith waver. You know, it can be hard with the death of a child. It can be so hard to keep your faith strong. Sarah has kept her faith strong through that whole trial. Do not ever let go of your faith. That's the second point. And the third strategy is do not fear. Never fear. 2 Corinthians 4, 9, Paul says, I am persecuted but not forsaken. I am struck down but I am not destroyed. This next story to illustrate never fearing is a story taken from a Christian organization called Open Doors. Open Doors is an organization that protects persecuted Christians. This is a story about a young Indian woman named Mary. She converted from Hinduism to Christianity. After she uh, came to Christ, her family, her mother and her sisters also came to Christ. And she said, my Hindu neighbors began to um, insult us. She said, but their insults were nowhere near as powerful as the joy that I felt in Christ. And so they didn't bother me. But one day we were coming home from church and my neighbors began to attack us. They threw stones at us and they tackled us. And I was being strangled, she said, by a, a cloth around my neck. And her neighbors stopped them. They went to the hospital, her mother and her sisters, and she were all hospitalized after the attack. She said, then I was terrified. I was afraid to go out of my house after the attack. I had nightmares and it was really hard for me to overcome the fear. She said, I slowly started to fortify myself in prayer, reading the Bible, writing down my thoughts in the form of songs, and I've since found courage in the Word of God. God protects me and comforts me, and I've learned never to fear. So that's the third point. Do not ever fear whatever it is you're going through. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says this to us about persecution. Do not fear. Do not fear, Jesus says. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, do not be afraid when persecution comes. Do not be afraid when hardship comes. The only thing we need to fear is becoming complacent, becoming a church that has forgotten how to share Christ. talked about this before, but if our church, our mission statement is to know Christ and to make Christ known. Now the first part of that mission statement, to know Christ, that's an internal activity, knowing Christ. We study the Bible together. We pray for each other. We enjoy each other's fellowship. We build up and strengthen the church. That's all the internal activity of the church, very important. The second part of our mission statement is to make Christ known, and that's all the outward activity of the church, bringing Christ to other people. If all we're doing is the inward work of the church, being comfortable in fellowship, praying with each other, studying scripture together, knowing Christ more deeply, personally, and individually, that's great. But we'll never be persecuted if that's what we're doing because we'll never be a threat. And we'll only be doing half of our mission statement. We need to fulfill the other half, which is also bringing Christ out. And that is when persecution comes. So those four strategies, and the fourth is know that God will bring you through this time of persecution. Know that God will be with you in this time of persecution. That's what we see in verse 11. Peter says, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. The Lord will bring you through. So the four strategies, forgive, love, and pray for your persecutors. Second, keep persevering. Do not waver in your faith. Third, refuse to let fear win. And fourth, trust and rely on God. Jesus taught us to expect persecution and to rejoice in it. In Luke chapter 6, verse 22, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy. Leap for joy. 
because great is your reward in heaven. So I realize this is an intense message, the persecution of the church, also about our personal persecution, but those four strategies are the ways that we personally and the church can overcome this persecution. Let us pray. Lord God, we see through this story from your word in the book of Acts that your church has been persecuted from the very beginning. You've prepared us by teaching us to expect persecution, and it comes in many forms. Give us enough love to enable us to love those who are persecuting us. Give us enough of your resolve to help us to persevere. Give us enough of your calm that we will never fear. And give us enough faith in you to know that we will make it through any trial. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, whatever it is that you're facing, I pray that with Peter, you would also be able to say, I can see it. I can see that the Lord has sent his angel to deliver me from the hands of Herod. 
Whatever your Herod is, you are delivered. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.